Number 70, People v. Norman McBride. <laughs> Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Mr. Roth. Would you like to reserve some time? Yes, please. Rebuttal? Three minutes. How much? Three minutes, Your Honor. Three? Okay. You may proceed. Go ahead. Good afternoon. May it please the Court. My name is Josh Roth. I'm with the law firm of Freed Frank in New York City and in association with the Office of the Appellate Defender. I represent the appellant, Norman McBride. This Court should reverse Mr. McBride's conviction for at least two <coughs> separate but related reasons. First, Mr. McBride's warrantless home arrest cannot be justified under the emergency exception to the New York State Constitution because the police went to and entered his apartment with the primary intent to arrest him and search his apartment, violating this Court's decision in Mitchell and effectively evading his right How to be indulged. How do we know that that was their intention? I mean, is there a finding of fact as to what they intended? No, Your Honor. There is no express finding of fact as in, to in what In fact, that wasn't really even litigated below, was it? It was not as expressly litigated, of course, as it was before this Court. However, we I, I couldn't find anything in the record where defense, where the defendant or defense counsel ever asked the trial court or the appellate division to consider any subjective motivation of the officer. Where do we have that issue? Uh, well, respectfully, Your Honor, before the appellate division first department, uh, Mr. McBride expressly relied on Mitchell before the suppression court. Mr. McBride's counsel never expressly referenced Mitchell. However, we submit that this issue is preserved. Uh, for example, Mr. McBride, undisputably in his omnibus uh, suppression motion, objected to the constitutionality of his arrest inside his apartment without a warrant. Uh, we think it's worth noting that the people, not Mr. McBride, bears the burden of justifying his warrantless home arrest. Uh, it's not. It wasn't, wasn't the issue that was raised at, uh, before the suppression court the, uh, the claim that the, exit, the emergency was, uh, was police generated? That was the exception that the people offered in order to justify Mr. McBride's warrantless home arrest. However, we submit that the relevant exception to New York State's warrant requirement is, in fact, the emergency doctrine. And under the emergency doctrine, as this Court has articulated it from 1976 onward in People v. Mitchell, uh, it's essential to uh, evaluate the subjective intent of the arresting officer. I mean, Brigham City doesn't change. Sorry. I'm sorry. Brigham City doesn't change that in any way. No, Your Honor. Brigham City does not change that. Brigham City, of course, interpreted the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution and does not bind this Court. It's an interpretation of the New York State Constitution. This Court hasn't hesitated in the past, and it shouldn't do so now, to interpret the parallel provision to the Fourth Amendment, Article 1, Section 12, more expansively. So Mitchell is still good law, and um, we can't apply the emergency exception here? That's correct, Your Honor. Mitchell remains good law. Uh, you're drawing a distinction between exigency and emergency? No, Your Honor. We are not drawing such a distinction. I we view I'm Why isn't there a distinction between the two? Uh, Why wasn't this? I mean, I could envision where, based on the fact this woman came out, she wasn't able to answer questions. They were concerned that perhaps he was inside with a firearm. This wasn't an emergency exception. Uh, under the New York State Constitution because the police, as the record develops, uh, pages 44 through 46. I'm not, I'm not talking about that issue. We're on whether it was an exigent circumstance. No, you're Why, right. Why, under the facts of this case, was there not a reasonable view by the police officers that there was an exigent circumstance to make sure there wasn't someone with a firearm in the residence? Uh, there were a variety of factors. For example, uh, when Mr. McBride's house guest fled the apartment, the police officers uh, explained that they spoke to that guest for five to ten seconds. An ambulance, for example, was never called. Uh, lead all of the events leading up to uh, that critical event of the house guest fleeing Mr. McBride Bride's apartment uh, strongly suggests that there was no emergency and that, in fact, any emergency was created by the police. I think the distinction we're trying to create is let's assume there's no emergency and they're, and they're going to the apartment and they, they, they intend to at least question, maybe arrest the, the defendant. Uh, and then as the situation develops, it gets kind of heated and, and all of a sudden this lady's hyperventilating and, 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 and they get nervous and they don't know what the defendant's going to do and they react accordingly. 
Is there anything wrong with the police doing that? In a case such as this, there is something wrong with the police doing that. In this case, the police had ample opportunity to obtain a warrant and should have. Had they not gone to the apartment, but none it's of not, these it's events not, would It's not unfolded. against the law to go and pound on somebody's door and yell for him to come out without a warrant. Uh, I mean, it depends. You can, you can question the wisdom of it, but it's not against the law. Uh, no, Your Honor, that's correct. However, if that crosses the line. But if, and if, if while you're doing that, you see something that leads you to believe there's a life-threatening situation in the apartment. I, I understand that you could be skeptical about the life-threatening situation, but assume, assume you did. Assume, yeah, assume, assume they saw something a little, a little more spectacular. Assume they, uh, they saw somebody bound and gagged in there. Uh, they, they're allowed to go in, right? Of course, Your Honor. They're allowed to go in. However, under this Court's precedent in Mitchell, because the police shouldn't have been there in the first place without a warrant, well, should no, they, no, should... they They were allowed to be there. They weren't allowed to go in, but they were, they were allowed to be there, same as you and I are allowed to be there, aren't we? Uh, assuming that we had access to Mr. McBride's apartment building, of course. Uh, however, but the police What was were... happening on the fire escape? There were a few police officers on the fire escape peering into the apartment? Yes, Your Honor. There were two police officers on the fire escape peering into the apartment with well, their guns drawn. With all that police the... activity going on, couldn't it be assumed that they could help to create whatever emergency took place? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, we strongly submit that that is what happened in the case. The people banging on the door, shining the flashlight in the back window, and yelling and screaming to come out. I mean, that kind of creates chaos in and of itself, does it not? Absolutely, Your Honor. And the facts suggest that in this case, all was calm up until the police officers ascended the fire escape, continued pounding on the door, ordered Mr. McBride to leave his apartment, and then very surprisingly to the people, someone fled the apartment. Uh, every indication suggests that the police created this exigency and then used it to justify their uh, warrantless entrance into Mr. Bride's apartment. Do you want to discuss the lineup because you raise that? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, one of our arguments in our brief concerns the constitutionality of the lineup ID. Mr. McBride was arrested wearing a gray hooded sweatshirt and uh, Eyewitnesses to the cozy robbery identified the perpetrator as, amongst other things, wearing a gray hooded sweatshirt. Mr. McBride. The hearing court said that that was generic and common article of clothing. Why isn't that so? Uh, it may very well be a somewhat generic article of clothing. However, given the context of this case, that Mr. McBride was the only person wearing a gray hooded sweatshirt, that his weight and height did not uh, well, all, all the physical, especially the facial attributes of the individuals in the lineup were all somewhat similar. They it's were. Just, it's just they, the clothing that you are concerned with? We're primarily focused on the clothing. However, there are notable, noticeable differences with respect. Is that uh, because the clothing was part of the description that was given to the police, that he was wearing a gray hoodie? That, that's right, Your Honor. Uh, and the people in their opposition brief uh, cite to the fact that uh, the perpetrator was identified as wearing other articles of clothing. However, in the lineup, uh, as is part of the record, none of the fillers, nor Mr. McBride, were wearing jackets. None of them were wearing construction gloves. None of them were wearing hats. So the only relevant article of clothing that the uh, filler, that the uh, ID witnesses had the opportunity to observe uh, was that gray hooded sweatshirt. What's, what's our standard of review on the suggestiveness of the identification? Of the uh, given the appellate division's finding on this matter, uh, this court needs to determine that uh, there's no uh, support in the record, that as a matter of law, this type of ID is constitutionally infirm. Uh, Didn't individual number three in the lineup also have what appears in the photo to be a, a sweatshirt on, something with a hood? Uh, he did, Your Honor, without looking at that specific photo, if I recall correctly, that was different a black color. sweatshirt a colors, green instead of gray. And while that might not appear uh, in a grayscale photocopy, uh, it, which is at least the photo that Mr. McBride's counsel has, uh, live witnesses would certainly be able to discern a difference between the two. Uh, returning to our uh, argument under Mitchell, uh, the record in this case makes it patently clear that the police went to Mr. McBride's apartment and crossed the threshold into his apartment uh, with the primary intent to arrest him. 
they may have also, in an ancillary way, been responding to the house guest's flight from Mr. McBride's apartment. However, it should be clear that they went to his apartment and entered because they wanted to arrest him. Well, is there, is there, a, is there a difference between going with the primary intent to arrest him and going with the primary intent to bust into his apartment? That is, the, what if, yeah, isn't it consistent with this record that the primary intent was to induce him to come out of the apartment so that they could arrest him? Well, if the, to directly answer your question, if the police officer's uh, intent was to induce Mr. McBride or anyone else to exit the apartment, that sounds very much like they themselves created an exigency intentionally in order to cause uh, well, reason. No, if, they, if they knock on the door and say, I've got a FedEx package for, for Norman McBride, and he comes out and they say, well, come over here uh, uh, out on the threshold. I want you to sign out here. And he does. They can grab him, can't they? That's, that's, uh, that's legal. That's absolutely legal. legal. This court permits bruises. Uh, however, in this case, Mr. McBride never left uh, the confines of the I understand, of but, but, but I'm talking about their intent when they went up there. Uh, they may have been a little less subtle than I was suggesting. Their, in, their intent was to tell him in an aggressive voice that he should come out of the apartment and hope he did it. Uh, that's right. The that's what they did. I mean, and that is not in itself an intent to do something unlawful. The intent to do something unlawful occurred the moment that the police officers crossed the threshold into Mr. McBride's apartment. Yeah, I guess what I'm saying is how do we know from this record that they intended to cross that threshold one second before they crossed it? Uh, the judicial reasoning of this court uh, should look at the facts and see that uh, they suggest that the police officers had the intent from the moment they left the precinct house when they arrived at Mr. McBride's apartment, when they were standing on, outside his apartment on the fire escape, and when they crossed his threshold. All right. I Thank you, Ms. Roth. You have your three minutes of rebuttal you. time. Ms. Poole? Good afternoon, Your Honors. Good afternoon. Uh, here, the suppression court and the appellate division determined that the warrantless entry into Mr. McBride's apartment was justified by exigent circumstances. And those, as you know, are specifically a woman emerging, so crying, and hyperventilating to such an extent that she could not even tell the police whether she was okay. And, so, and, and this, this caused the police officer not to rush her to safety, but to rush into the apartment to see if there was a life-threatening situation inside? Well, at that point, she had already emerged. There were other officers there uh, who apparently... So she, he, he went in to see if maybe there's some other hyperventilating women who might be in danger? Uh, hopefully there wouldn't be, but uh, certainly saying, something isn't, 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 isn't this a stretch? I understand that we're not supposed to review findings of fact below, but isn't the, testimony, his, the officer's testimony that he went in to see if he could save a life, uh, doesn't that induce quite a bit of skepticism? Not in this particular case, Your Honor, because in, in addition to everything else that's going on here, the police know that this is a man identified as an armed robber. Why didn't they get a warrant? Why didn't they get a warrant? The record doesn't say, but, but as this Court has realized, they, they are allowed to go to his apartment to seek his cooperation. Did they precipitate this by going on the fire escape and flashing the lights in there and kind of creating this atmosphere of confusion well, what's, that what's, caused her to exit? What's interesting about this case is that even though that's what was argued below, before the suppression court, that the police had created this, this insanely crazy uh, circumstance, the witness that they put on didn't testify consistently with that. Um, her testimony was uh, that the officers were knocking. She uh, agreed to not answer the door as Mr. McBride had instructed her to do. Um, when she saw the, the police officers out on the fire escape with the flashlights and the gun, she smoked a cigarette. Um, and according to her, when she came out, she wasn't even all that upset. I'm still trying to figure out why they didn't get a warrant. I mean, I, I, I understand you say it's not in the record, but I mean, she got all of this information and then took the next two days off. I mean, apparently maybe she was entitled to them, but it, it's clear that they had all kinds of time to get a warrant and to get, and, and to get a search warrant if they chose and, and to prepare themselves for this. And now they're in a situation where they show up without a warrant and we're fighting over whether or not she was smoking a cigarette or whether or not the, the, the officer in the, on, the, on the fire escape, who I guess somebody says that's a public spot, I, I didn't know that, uh, with, a, with, a, with a flashlight is, is alarming everyone in the apartment. Well, Mr. McBride wasn't, didn't appear very alarmed, um, and he certainly never fled out of the apartment. As for not Do you see our concern here? I mean, this is a, this is a private citizen's home. I mean, 
Granted, you, in, in this case, apparently he's a bad guy. But, I mean, can they come to your house, you know, six of them, and, and surround you and say, you know, we think that the fire escape is, uh, is public property so we can stand on there and we can bang on your door and, gee, if you panic, then we'll come in and search your house. Well, the issue of the fire escape is, is by this Court's ruling, I believe the case is Funches, um, that says that... No, that but you understand that the, the, the big picture here does not look good? I, well, no, I... What's the answer I, question? Can they do it at your house? <laughs> if they have a, a reason to be... Um, no, they have no reason at all. Can they do it? Can they come to m and do knock exactly on my door? Exactly what they did here. Exactly what they did here. With no reason at all. Sure. They, uh, they're allowed to come to, to, to... Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, that would be particularly odd. And, and, and of course, what the Fourth Amendment is to protect is... Um, you know, the, the sanctity of the home, absolutely. But it is not to provide uh, a sanctuary but, for a criminal. But, but can't you avoid the, 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 the patent and the fourth issue by getting a warrant? Uh, yes. I mean, that, that's certainly an option. And that, but the police have several legal options here. And that they chose one over the other, they're, enti they're entitled to you're, go to You're the saying department. they are entitled to go into someone's home without a warrant. They have an option of getting a warrant, but they don't have to. They're entitled to arrest somebody without a warrant. They should get a warrant, but they don't have to. What, what is the meaning of the fourth? <laughs> well, fourth? They, they, they can't cross over. They couldn't cross over the threshold. So what do they do, scare everybody out? But that wasn't what they were doing. The, the courts below found that, that what the police actually did here well, I thought you was said not you, they were trying to persuade to them anybody. to come out. What? I thought you said they were trying to persuade them to come out. They weren't trying to scare anybody out. They were there, there, there was rather vigorous persuasion. <laughs> well, police, oh, police open up. That's, uh, that, that's, that's pretty persuasive. Because what the, they, they arrive coming after defendant, who is a parolee. He's, an, he's, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's horrible. He's and a they, criminal. And they, but, he has the same, but we just agree that he has the same rights you have in your home. Right, and he's, but he's not the one who's disturbed. The, the issue is that it's actually Ms. Mitchell who emerges from the, the apartment Smoking disturbed. And there's no indication that they even knew she was there. So it, it's not as if the police are going there. But if she said, do you have a warrant, they'd say no. Do you have a warrant for anyone's arrest? No. Well, then I'm going to finish my cigarette and continue to watch Jeopardy. I mean, I, I'm missing why, why we're so casual about that. Why, why, we why don't we're so casual? About getting warrants. I mean, particularly when you got time and, and there, there's no pursuit here. And, and they apparently knew where he was. Well, that's, that's a policy issue. And this, this court has never determined that simply because the officers can get a warrant, they must get a warrant. That's simply never been the law. The police have never been held to that kind of standard before. So while, yes, looking at these facts and the way that this case developed. Should, we, should there be some type of a rule or regulation or guidance with respect to if the chaos is created by the officers themselves? There, there is case law about that, Your Honor. Yes. The, the, the officers cannot come and, and create an exigent situation. Is there any evidence here that that's not exactly what happened? There, there is an indication that Ms. Mitchell's reaction may, may have been in response to the police. Well, well the, my but point that is, is that, not that they're saying there's exigent circumstances that made them go in to make sure somebody else was safe or something. Right. But you're arguing this afternoon that she was calm, that she was smoking a cigarette. That, so, I mean, if she was calm and was smoking a cigarette and didn't seem to be upset, they had no reason to go in. If, if we disbelieve her and they say she was upset and everything else and we went in because of that, then they caused it, right? Well, my, my point in talking about her testimony is simply that one of the reasons that the the lower courts made the factual determinations that they did is that much of her testimony simply did not um, support the defense theory um, that the police had created these exigent circumstances, that they had come intending to scare her, which was the... In well, is, is that the... I mean, do they have to... Do they have to know... I mean, obviously, they didn't come knowing uh, he's got a young woman in the apartment and will scare her and make her cry and come in. No, it's, it's ridiculous to say that was their plan. Right. Their plan was to go up and uh, pound the door, look in the window, yell, police open up, and hope he came out. We, we, that had to be their plan, yes. right? Uh, now, if in reaction to that, <coughs> what happens is a woman gets frightened and creates 
some appearance of emergency, is that enough to let them go in? Yes, because at that point, they don't know what has caused that reaction. In, in retrospect, as we look at, at the record and, and what developed after that, it would appear most likely that, sh that, that the police did cause her reaction. In that moment, though, the police officers don't know that. Is it true that but for that, they could not have gone in? Under the circumstances here, yes, and they did not. So but, but for her being upset, they're banging, they're being in the windows, they're in everything else, they, they could not have gone into that apartment and they could not have affected arrest because they didn't have a warrant for either one. Right, and, and, they, and they did not go into well, the, the apartment. The appellate division gave several other reasons. They said, uh, we conclude that this warrantless entry was justified by exigent circumstances, including, in particular, the violent nature of the underlying offense, the knowledge of the police, the defendant was in the apartment, and the reasonable belief that he was armed, and the behavior and demeanor of, uh, uh, of the woman that suggested a dangerous and volatile situation. They gave three reasons. Right, and, and here the, the courts were applying the test but for... But you admit the third of the three is indispensable. They couldn't go in just with the first two. I'm sorry, the... They gave three reasons, but, they had, but, 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 but without the crying woman, the fact that there was a bad guy with a gun in there doesn't do it. Yeah, right, under these circumstances. If right. we disagree with that conclusion and feel that there wasn't an exigent circumstance, is that the end of this case? Do we then not get into Brigham and Mitchell and the other issues? If, if you were to find that there's no support for the, the lower court's conclusions... Uh, that there were, was an exigent circumstance. I mean, I know you don't agree with that. I'm just saying right. um, what happens if we were to reach that finding. I, I think if it, you, right, I don't, I don't think you would get to the, to the Brigham Mitchell question. Um, in fact, I don't think the court will get to the Brigham Mitchell question at all anyway, because it, that's an unpreserved issue here. Um, but, but were this court to disagree with the lower court's findings, uh, yes, I think, I think that would be off the table. Do you want to discuss the uh, lineup? Uh, certainly, Your Honor. Uh, basically, in, in this case, one of the, one of the witnesses who identified a uh, defendant described him as having worn a gray hooded sweatshirt uh, over which he was wearing a black flight jacket. He also had on a hat. He was, he was carrying uh, construction gloves with polka dots, I believe. And at the, at the lineup, a uh, defendant was wearing apparently the same uh, hooded sweatshirt or perhaps another one. Um, two of the other fillers were wearing sweatshirts as well, one of them hooded. Uh, the other two were wearing T-shirts. The lower courts found that all of these are very generic pieces of clothing. There was nothing um, particularly uh, outstanding about a gray sweatshirt, unlike Ex other cases. Except that it was part of the description that was given to the police. Right, but it wasn't, it wasn't as if, um, it wasn't something particularly distinctive. It wasn't, you know, a fuchsia sweatshirt with big, bold flowers or, you know, something odd. This was a very standard piece of clothing, like blue jeans or sneakers, or, which were other ar articles of clothing that he was wear wearing. Um, if, for instance, in this case, the defendant had been the only one wearing uh, a black flight jacket, that might have been a different scenario, and there are certainly case, cases like that where, uh, the defendant was described as wearing a snorkel jacket, and he was the only person in the lineup wearing a snorkel jacket, uh, things like that. But if we're talking about very generic pieces of clothing, um, there's no reason to believe that that is what is going to, uh, to sway a witness um, it, it, to, to wrongfully identify uh, a defendant. Also, it bears noting that it was, according to the record, it was one witness describing him wearing that that jacket, that witness did identify him. He was also identified in that lineup by two other witnesses uh, to the crime. Okay. Um, <laughs> nothing else? Um, I would just, uh, Wind up, yeah. again, I would, I would point out that the, the primary motivation uh, test here of Mitchell was not preserved below. The, the defense never argued that the court um, if it found actual exigent circumstances, so it should determine what the officer's primary motivation was at the moment they stepped over the threshold. Um, even if this court were to reach that issue of, uh, of whether primary motivation was met here, it was, because the, the officers made clear that the reason they finally made that decision to step over the threshold, something they had never done, uh, throughout the entire series of events. It was only after Ms. Mitchell emerged 
What's the, what's the net effect? Were, were we to disagree with you and find that uh, they, they, that the, the uh, entrance into the apartment was uh, was illegal? What's the, the net effect? Yeah. I mean, what, what, what's, what gets suppressed? Uh, the uh, clothing that was found uh, on the table, I believe, would be suppressed. Um, and we would argue that the uh, case should be sent back to the, to the appellate division to make a determination of whether the statements were sufficiently attenuated. That was oh, right, um, right, right. something that the suppression court reached and uh, the appellate division did not. Um, and finally, uh, with regards to the primary motivation test, this court should follow um, the Brigham Court decision um, and this court's decision in Robinson regarding primary motivation, that these subjective intent questions uh, are not appropriate under uh, New York constitutional evaluations um, and that the court should instead look towards the objective circumstances and whether or not uh, those justified a warrantless entry. And unless you have any other questions. Thank you. Um, Mr. Roth, you have your rebuttal. Three minutes. Your Honor, Judge Piggott hit it precisely on the head of the nail. Uh, this case is about why the police failed to get a warrant. There's no explanation for but that. You're right that they don't have to, and they don't have to explain it as long as they don't violate the code. <coughs> you're right, Your Honor. Uh, however, in this case, uh, as uh, has been pointed out by several uh, members of the bench, uh, the police went to Mr. McBride's apartment uh, quite clearly in order to arrest him, and through their conduct, caused such a ruckus that uh, a house guest of Mr. McBride left the apartment, and the police then used well, that, that. That may be what happened, but didn't both courts below find the opposite? That's right, Your Honor, but they were wrong, and there's and no factual. So, you, so we have to conclude that there's no record support for any contrary finding. That's right, and I think this court could easily arrive at that conclusion. Uh, both the suppression court and the appellate division relied heavily on various factors uh, relating to the exigent circumstances exception, for example, whether Mr. McBride may have been armed, the seriousness of the offense. However, the touchstone of both of their analyses concerned uh, the house guest flight from the apartment. And since that flight was almost necessarily caused by the police uh, conduct in this action, uh, the result that follows must be that their entry was unconstitutional. It's not I, unusual, you know, in, in, uh, and I think, for example, in domestic violence cases, uh, where quite often the protocols now are that someone someone leaves the house, and not necessarily someone gets arrested, but there's there's going to be a, someone's going to leave the house. Now, the police get there, and the last thing they're expecting is that not necessarily expecting, but they don't want a chaos to, to occur, but it does. And are, are we are we wandering into a rule where every time they go to a domestic violence dispute uh, and chaos erupts, that somehow? Any arrest they make is, is subject to, to collateral attack because they were the ones that caused the disruption by showing up? No, I don't think so, Your Honor. Uh, how would you define that and how would you distinguish Well, a critical distinction is that this was not a domestic dispute. When police are responding to a domestic dispute. Well, yeah, but we dispute, can't write a rule that says, in, you know, the Fourth Amendment applies except in uh, domestic disputes. Of course, that's true. But the police, uh, in their mind, would have uh, different considerations entering. How, as a judge, how would you how would you define the rule that, uh, in the, in the case of uh, People versus McBride that's now going to be? Well, I think w the critical distinction is that here the police went in order to arrest Mr. McBride. That wouldn't be the case in most domestic dispute scenarios. So, in such a case as this, where the police had ample opportunity to obtain a warrant went to a suspect's home without a warrant and then engaged in this type of raucous behavior, apparently without appreciating the impact of their behavior on others, then the fruits of that illegal entry should be suppressed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Honor.